sometimes it happens that we know the size of the population. Look at this. All of the questions that we were answering up to now were assuming that we have a population. From that population, we took a sample of size n, and then we are predicting the parameter of the population based on the statistic of the sample. Um, so, um, we didn't know what is the size of the population. So, the assumption in all of our calculations so far was that the size of the population is infinite. Now, if somebody tells us that the size of the population is finite, then we know that the proportion that is in our sample is a good chunk of the, uh, basically, the whole population. Of course, is, if the population is population of the United States and there are 350 million people, or population of China uh, is, you know, 1.7 billion and you have a tiny sample, um, basically, you know that the methods that we used is, uh, you know, can, it can be continued and, you know, it's very similar to infinite for us. But uh, if the size of the population is comparable to the size of the sample that we are taking, then even a small sample size uh, can give us more confidence than usual. It says that a gift shop advertises that they stock 500 items that are priced under $50. Okay, so we know how many items is that. So you have to be very careful when they tell us the total. And we write that down here with capital N. In that question, it is telling us that the size of the population is 500. That is the total number of books that they have under $50. And then they take a sample of 49. So basically they are taking the sample size is 49. And it's like 10% of the population is in our sample. And the sample shows that the mean of the sample is $40. So I write it inside the sample. The mean of the sample is $40. And the sample standard deviation is $9. Notice that these are what we have access to, and we're using these symbols for them. So the standard deviation is 9 in the sample that we have, and the uh, mean is 40. Now, if I ask you what is the best estimate for that unknown mean of all of these 500 items, what is your answer? 40. Exactly. And now the question says, develop a 99% confidence interval. So the question is asking us to find 99% confidence interval. And uh, now if you want to find 99% confidence interval, you have to think of, okay, how much these X bars can vary. So if you think about, this is one of the samples that are possible, we can take another sample and another sample. And of course, the mean of these samples would vary but we know that the mean of the samples don't vary very much. We know a lot about it. We know that the mean of the, uh, all of the possible samples, they vary, but their variation is like this. So if we draw the distribution of all possible X bars, uh, they have a distribution based on central limit theorem. We know that they have a normal distribution. And we know that the mean of all of the sample means is the that unknown mean of the population, and the standard deviation of all of the possible sample means is the standard deviation of population divided by the square root of n. Very good. This is what central limit theorem tells us. But unfortunately, we don't know sigma, and this is the time that we feel sad because we don't have sigma and we cannot use central limit theorem. At this point, around 1900, somebody came to help us and he was Mr. Gossett. Very good. He said that you can use your best estimate 
for standard deviation of the population, which is your standard deviation of the sample, and use that estimation. But then, instead of using normal distribution, you have to use this T distribution that I give you, and you always have to use the degree of freedom of N minus 1, which in this case would be, degree of freedom would be 48. So now, with the help of Gosset, we can go forward and use our best estimate for sigma. So our best estimate for the mean of the population is... 40. 40. And our best estimate for a standard deviation of the population is... 9. Thank you. And now we divide it by 49, and we ask help. 1.2857. Very good. Now, our best estimate for the mean of the population is 40, but we are not sure that the mean of the population is 40. However, in this case, we want this area to cover 99% of possibilities. So we want to know if we take continuously, take samples, where, what is the range that 99% of those sample means will land in. So we want this whole area to be 0.99. And because we are using T distribution, uh, we don't need to go to half because usually T distributions, they have a specific uh, headers that tell us the confidence interval. So go to your T distribution and look at row 48 and from the header find 99% confidence and tell me how many standard deviations I have to go above and below the mean? 2.682. Did everybody get the same thing? What row did yes. you go to again? Row 48. 99%. Row 48. And header should be 99%. We always write the degree of freedom of T right beside it, so we, we don't forget. Yep, I got the same answer. Okay, the same thing? Okay. So 2.68, two standard devi deviations above and below the mean. Uh, but now, in this specific situation, we know the size of the population. So maybe I change the color from here on. But this is what we would do, usually. But in this case, we have a correction factor for the standard deviation of variations of X bar. So we know that the size of the population is not, is not infinite, it is finite. So our, our standard deviation is less than this. You know, the possible variations of X bar is less than what we usually use and we have to basically apply this finite population correction factor and this finite population correction factor it is n minus n divided by n Minus one. Now look at this uh, fraction. One in this case would be 500 minus minus 49 divided by 500 minus one. Is this bigger than one or smaller than one? Okay, let me show you. It, this fraction is always smaller than one because the size of the sample is usually more than one. So this in this case would be 500 minus 49, and the denominator is always the size of the population minus 1. And because the size of the sample is always more than 1, therefore the numerator is always less than the denominator, 
Therefore, no matter what, this correction factor, finite population correction factor, is always turns out to be a number less than one. So in this case, what is it? 0 0.9507 for decimal, yeah. 0, 7. Yeah. Okay, so this is the correction factor, and we know that it's always, you know, when we know the size of the population, our estimation for the variations of X bar or P, P bar, proportion of the sample, would be less. There is less likely that the sample mean would vary because the population is not infinitely big. So actually, the standard deviation of the variation of the X bar, considering the correction factor, would be one point. 28 multiplied by this correction factor, which is 0 0.9507, which will become a smaller number. Uh, and that will be what? 1.2169. Right. Okay. This is decimal point. Okay. So now we consider this extra information that we have, and actually our variation, the possible variations of distribution of X bar is a little less than 1.28, it is 1.21, okay? Now we can go ahead and uh, write what we wanted to write. The upper bound of confidence interval is the mean plus uh, 2.682 standard deviations and our, you know, final expectation for the variations of X bar is 1.2169 and the lower bound of confidence interval is 40 minus 2.682 multiplied by 1.2169 and here you come to my help so it's 43.2637 and the lower bound 36.7362 very good uh I had a question. When do we know when to use the correction factor? When we know the size of the population. Okay, perfect. Thank you.